appreciate that so much. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 4 as we finish the chapter on love one another. And uh, titled the message tonight, Prove It. Prove it. You know, it's easy to say it, but you need to prove it. Um, faith without works is dead, and love without loving one another is just a dialogue. Amen? And so we need not to talk the talk, we need to walk the walk. And I appreciate you loving God enough to be in the house of God uh, this, this afternoon. And uh, I hope that you love the Lord. And we'll prove it tonight if you do. Uh, somebody asked me if it, you could just come on Friday night because they have a, uh, some conflicts on Saturday. That'd be fine. Brother George, appreciate you coming and hearing him preach. And he's a faithful man. He's been through a lot of tribulation in his family. And he's still uh, walking the walk and not just talking the talk and living for God and pastoring. And um, it's going to be a four-course meal and he'll be preaching. So you'll, you can have the Friday night if you can't come on Saturday. But you got to let us know by 8.30. Okay? If I'm not finished preaching by 8.30, just go up there and call Brother McCulley. 911, I'm coming. You know, but uh, uh, we got to know by 8.30 because they've got to plan the menu. Filet mignon or whatever it is. Probably filet fried chicken, but I don't know. All right, let's, let's stay in awe of the Word of God. 1 John chapter 4. I want to back up to verse 11. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Amen? You know, that speaks to my heart. If God can love us, surely we can love everybody else. Amen? God can forgive us. Surely we can forgive everybody else. Look at verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. What a challenge. We're, hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us his spirit. And We have seen and do testify that the, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he is, he is in God. But confession is not just enough with the mouth. But it says, for we have known and believed the, the love of God that hath to us. I'm saved. And God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect, fear, perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, there's the subject tonight, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for the good attendance tonight. Thank you for every child that's here uh, by the grace of God uh, that's been brought in by vans and buses. And God, we appreciate the sacrifice of these folks that come straight from work, load up an old van or a bus, and uh, bring these dear children to the house of God on Wednesday night. Lord, I appreciate their sacrifice. I appreciate their labor of love. I appreciate their love for these children. Now, Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'd use this uh, last message in 1 John 4. And, uh, God, I pray that you'd help us to realize that verbal proclamation is not enough. We need to have something visible. We need the, the Lord to be seen in our life through our love one for another. And we'll praise you and thank you for what you do in and through this message in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to see... First of all, a verbal proclamation of our love for God. And folks, that love, it should be true. A love that should be true. And folks, it ought to be true to what you believe and it affects your behaving. And uh, there's no doubt about it, the Lord loves us. He does not have to prove it. If you look back to Calvary, you see, as verse 19 says, we loved him because he first loved us. The Bible goes on back to say in um, verse 9, And this was manifested, the love of God towards us, because God sent His only begotten Son 
of the world that we might be like live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means the satisfying of God's justice. And the only way to satisfy God's justice is sin demanded death. And Jesus took our debt. I preached at YDC last night, and I used the illustration I've used a hundred times probably in the 35 years I've been going there, in that the judge sentenced the, uh, the guilty one in court to death. And then all of a sudden he took his robe off, and he went down and said, but I'll take your death for you. But you have to accept it. You have to believe it. And the prisoner would say, okay, judge, you take my death. And all those young people last night looked at me and said, boy, if that was me, I'd take it. And I told them the greatest judge that ever walked, ever was in heaven and ruled over this whole earth, the Lord Jesus Christ did exactly that. He gave up the splendor and glory of heaven and came to this earth and loved you enough to die for you. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 3. Uh, if you'll turn there, Deuteronomy 13, 3. Uh, I want you to look at this verse. We'll take our time tonight. I'll still be finished about 20 minutes before they get out. Um, and some of you don't have children, so you can go on home and relax. But I appreciate you being here. Uh, Mark, uh, no, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 3, spoke to my heart today. And I hope it will speak to your heart. I want you to look at the verse very carefully. Deuteronomy 13, 3. The Bible says this. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. The word prove means he tests you. He puts you to the test. And I'll tell you how he really puts you to the test. Do you love the person that you dislike the most? God didn't say you had to like everybody, but you've got to love everybody. Let me rephrase that. God didn't say you had to love their ways, but you got to love them. Amen? I used to hate liquor because my daddy was an alcoholic. But I loved the alcoholic. I loved my daddy. Never stopped loving him. But I hated the liquor. I hated what it did to our family. So you can hate sin and love the sinner. Don't ever get that mixed up. And a lot of you have been hurt like I was when I was a child. But folks, we can't get bitter at someone that's a sinner because it's the devil's fault, it's the flesh's fault, it's the world's fault. But we need to prove our love, whether we love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now let me just say this. God does not have to prove a thing. But we do need to prove some things. We need to be proof positive evidence of the love of God. We need to be proof positive evidence that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The Bible says in John 13, 35, they'll know that your disciples cause you what? Love one another. 1 John 3, 14 says this. Back up to chapter 1 John 3, 14. It says, we know that we pass from death and life because what? We love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in what? Death. Death spiritually. So I want to tell you something, friend. Here's the credential. Here's the certification. Here's the proof of your salvation and your discipleship, do you love? Now, if you have a hard time loving people, you might need to get a new lover. You say you need to get a new liver, but that, that, wouldn't, that, that don't sound right. Amen? You need somebody to live through you, but you need somebody to love through you. And I want to tell you something, friend. If you're not careful, you'll live in bitterness and wrath and malice and anger, and you'll be no, no more better than the devil because you'll be holding grudges, and grudges will be holding you, and you'll go through life totally miserable. And may I say, making everybody else miserable. That's not God's calling in your life. God's calling in your life is to be proof. Prove whether you love God with all your heart and all your mind. That means you need to be like Jesus. And Jesus sacrificed. Jesus was submissive. And Jesus was faithful. He was faithful. He went all the way to the cross just for you. So don't get over that verse 19 before we get into our study. We love him because he first loved us. But here it is, verse 20, if a man say, if a man say, I love God, 
I meant to uh, look up this phrase. Maybe some of y'all with the fancy computers can look it up. But uh, he that saith is mentioned many, many times in this sweet book of fellowship. You'll say, you'll say, uh, if a man saith uh, that in his heart that he has not sinned, he maketh God a liar. I think that's 1 John uh, chapter 1. And uh, it says in verse 8, if we say we have no sin. It goes on and on saying if we say, if we say. And so folks, there's a difference in saying and being. Uh, anybody can say. Let me just say this, talk is cheap. Have you, ever, have you ever heard some people talk but didn't walk it? I tell you, it's really bad when a preacher preaches it and he doesn't live it. Uh, and there's a lot of that going on. But the Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Why not? He did that for you. Why not? Is that asking too much? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Why not? Because of the mercies of God, we ought to present ourselves. But it goes on to say, which is your reasonable service. So friend, listen, you're going to be tested. This is a test called love. And I'm going to tell you something, some people are very hard to love because they're full of themselves, they're full of the world, and they're full of the devil, and they don't even like God. That's hard to love, isn't it? And I'll tell you what, I, I was uh, minding my own business walking a mile this morning since I've got a free release and total health, good health bill, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting back in shape. I'm, 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 re I'm charged up, you know. And I was, I was watching the news, and it said that uh, uh, some old guy up in New York was uh, writing a book. And he, and, he, and he submitted that book to the New York Times, God help them, the most liberal paper in the nation, and said they're going to impeach Kavanaugh. I mean, he just went through hell and high water to get approved, crying and weeping, and, and they roasted him and crucified him. And I thought, oh, man. Why don't we major on improvement instead of impeachment? Why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, major on love? And I don't mean accepting sin, but I want to tell you something, friend. This liberal crowd that's against every conservative, and there's 150 new conservative judges in America. I like that. I'm conservative, by the way, and that's biblical. I'm not political. I'm biblical. I believe you ought to be conservative when it, life begins at conception. That's conservative. Amen? It's conservative have the right to preach whenever you want to and whenever you want to, and uh, that's, that's conservative. Uh, to live by the Constitution of the United States, that's conservative. And I don't apologize for being conservative, but it's hard for me to love a liberal that wants to run a judge out of office because he's conservative. That, it's hard. Boy, I just sit there and say, oh, man. I mean, aren't they going to ever get a positive platform? I know our president is guilty of that too, but I want to tell you something, friend. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about just being wicked liberals. I mean, you know, just let babies die if you can get, our, you can pad my pocketbook. That's about as selfish as you can ever get. That you would say, hey, long as the economy's good, we'll let you kill babies. No, I want to tell you something. Somebody says they're going to kill a baby, they ought to be run out of town. Say so, amen. But we're going to try to elect one for president. I didn't say we are. Somebody's going to try to elect one. And it just disturbs me. It makes me mad. And I know I have to pray and say, God, help me not get on the streets and start throwing things through windows like they're throwing things through windows. I got to love them. I got to pray for them. Don't mean I have to elect them, but praise God, I'm going to pray for them. Pray they get saved. Say amen. I don't believe you ought to vote by party. I believe you ought to vote by principle from the Word of God. Amen. Conservative. I don't apologize for it. If that makes you mad, I know whose side you're on. Because I'm going to tell you something, God's on the biblical side. But at the same time, you ought to love everybody. You ought to love everyone. I mean, you ought to love no matter what they say, no matter what they do. Uh, it's hard to love mass murderers. It's hard to love children abusers. It's hard to love them. I tell you, the greatest way we can help them and love them is get them saved. You go in these jails all the time. There's some wicked people. I mean, there's some wicked people. Uh, I, I preached to a 
children that's killed their daddies and mamas in the YDC. I mean, burned them to death, and I'm preaching to them. You know what I like to do? I like to kick them in the rear and, and say, go ahead and serve a life sentence. What was you doing dishonoring your parents and killing them? But I'm going to love them. I'm going to love them by bringing the gospel to them. I'm not going to compromise what the Bible says. I'm going to preach sin hard. I'm going to preach, I'm going to preach sin is horrible, and that's what made you horrible. But I'm going to love them. If I'm not, I'll just stop going to YDC. Hey, if we don't love them, let's stop going to jail. But folks, listen, we need to leave our comfort zone and go to people that are full of hate and envy and strife and vainglory and sin. It's a constant challenge to be full of God's love. So there's a verbal proclamation. And I want to ask you this question, and I almost put it in the notes. Does heaven amen your love? Because that's really who really counts. Does God appreciate and approve the way you love people? If you're full of hate, greed, and, and bitterness, I don't believe heaven's applauding your life. But I believe with all my heart, there ought to be an amen from heaven that you love God. And so when you say, I love God, you can fool the person in the pew behind you. Maybe, no, probably in front of you because they see how you listen to the Word of God. They probably don't think you love God a bit if you don't listen to the Word of God or respect it. But I'll tell you something, friend, that what really counts is what God knows about your life. Do you love God more than these, Peter? Do you love God more than yourself? Do you love God more than trying to get even when somebody's hurt you? How many has been hurt in your lifetime? Well, if you've been married over two weeks, you've been hurt. I shouldn't go in detail like that. But anyway, amen. John, you, y'all probably been hurt celebrating her birthday today. I thought it was anniversary. I was congratulating her. It's really messing me up that you're not sitting in the same place, but that's okay. <laughs> y'all change places, and I'll, I won't even know you're not here. But uh, I know exactly where you sit. But, it, it, you know, and you know exactly where you sit. I'll never forget Charlie Rivers one time. Somebody was sitting in his seat. We had these orange, ugly orange pews, orange, you know, the gold pews or orange carpet. That was the ugliest thing. All the Tennessee fans loved it. But anyway, orange and yellow. And uh, some visitors came and sit in his pew. And I saw him. He come in the door. He's about 83 years old. And he started circling that pew. The whole section. <laughs> Little old bitty man humped over. You know, it just... I said, he's going to do it. I know he's going to do it. He's going to do it. Went around again. Then went around again. Went around again. And then finally, he, he just couldn't stand anymore. And he said, sir, ma'am, you're in my pew. I said, oh, don't do that. <laughs> Amen. He come up here and sit on the platform. You're in my pew. If somebody sits in your pew, thank God for it. Amen. Amen. Sit next to them be a good idea. But I want to tell you something, folks. Anybody can say, I love God. But only God knows. Then I I think it's a love that should be told. It's a love that should be told. You know, if we love God, we're going to prove it by our, by, by our faithfulness, by our works, by our obedience, by our actions, our transactions, and our reactions. But second of all, not only is there verbal uh, uh, proclamation, and it should be true, what we say is true, that we love God, but there ought to be a love that's should be told a love that should be told you know in verse 20 it says this it says if a man say I love God and hateth his brother he is a liar for he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen how can he love God whom he hath not seen what a great question from uh, John and folks listen we need to realize that we need to express our love and one of the greatest ways to express your love is action. Be there when somebody's hurt. Uh, be concerned. Not only just talk, listen. That's hard for we men. Listen to somebody that's hurting. Uh, be there and count them as precious. You know, when somebody's precious to you, you stay with them. No matter what. I think about Miss Donna, and I think about Miss Linda, how precious they are to their husband. And I'm telling you, friend, it's almost weekly 
that they're doing some special meal. Uh, they're preparing some kind of special diet so they can, their dear husband can digest it. They're going to the emergency room in the middle of the night. And you know something, they're not doing it because they have to. They do it because they love their mate. And folks, we ought to love God enough to sacrifice and love God enough to be there when somebody wants to be there. Don't just say it, do it. Say in faith is found in John, James chapter 2. It says if you say that you believe God, oh, that's wonderful. Everybody can say it, but it says even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone, James 2, 17. It's dead faith if you don't have works. I don't say you work for your faith, but your faith works. Say amen. You know better than that. I don't believe you work to be saved, but if you're saved, there's some works. There's some fruit. But look at verse uh, 18. Yea, a man may say, James 2, 17, Thou hast faith, I have not worked, and I have works. Show me thy faith with, without thy works. And he said this, James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. It says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. They have emotional faith. They get nervous when God shows up. If you don't believe it, ask the Gadarean maniac uh, legion of devils. They got so nervous they went and uh, jumped in a bunch of pigs. And the pigs didn't want to live full of the devil. They'd rather have be full of bacon. Say amen. And they, they jumped over the... Uh, into the guff and drowned themselves. That's the first case of suicide in the Bible. But, uh, you know, um, you know, overlook that. But, uh, you know, I thank God, I thank God, friend, that we can realize that not even pigs want to be full of the devil. Why should we want to be full of ourselves? God delivers us from ourselves. And, folks, the devil majors in emotional faith. The devil majors in saying faith. The devil wants you to say you're saved so much that you think you're saved and what you need to do is prove that you're saved, prove that you have faith by your works, by the fruit. And if you want to say, I love you, prove it. I believe there's a lot of wives who would like to stand up and say, yeah, prove it. <laughs> Amen. You know, I love you, but I'm never around. Hey, I love you more than golf. They play 15 times a week, never, never spend any time with their, with their wife. Uh, I love you, and the same minute you say you love the Braves, which one you love the most? I love hot dogs, which one you love the most? We say we love a whole lot of things, and we say love very flippantly, but I want to tell you something, love is spelled God, and God said prove it. I'd almost say this, and I can't say it publicly, put up or shut up. Maybe all y'all old enough to hear that word, and we ought to. We ought to live what we profess. Uh, Pastor Rittenhouse and his family were on vacation traveling down the highway when they saw a suitcase fly off the top of their car going the opposite direction. They stopped to pick it up, but the driver of the other car just kept on going. The only clue to the driver's identity was a $20 gold piece inscribed given to Otis Sampson at the, at the retirement by Portland Cement Company. And after intensive correspondence, Otis, they didn't have Facebook then, they could have found him in 10 minutes. But Otis Sampson, Otis Sampson at his retirement by Portland Cement uh, Company to give, had this special gold medallion. And after intensive correspondence, Otis Sampson was located, contacted, he wrote a letter telling him to discard the whole suitcase and all its contents. But please send the gold piece to Mr. Sampson, uh, and he said, it's the most precious possession I have. And several times to describe the gold piece, he said, it's the most precious possession I have. Thank you. So Pastor Rittenhouse that found the suitcase did so and wrote a cover letter telling Otis Sampson about his most prized possession, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you ought to use opportunities to witness. Amen? You do something nice, cash it in with a, a track. You leave a good tip, I think you ought to leave a track. You don't leave a good tip, don't leave our church track. Okay, I've had people call me and say, you, there's some cheapskate that left a dollar up here at Chattanooga, and I sent him a five. But anyway, Jesus Christ 
he told him all about him in this letter. And a year later, the pastor received a Christmas package. And in it, to his amazement, was the $20 gold piece inscribed to Mr. Sampson. And he wrote, you will be happy to know that we have become active Christians in our local church. We want you to have this gold piece. I'm 74. My wife is 72. And you're the first ones to tell us about Jesus. Now, he is our most prized possession. You can have the gold medallion. Folks, he used an opportunity of kindness. And spent a lot of time with these correspondence is trying to find this Mr. Otis, found him, returned that gold medallion that was the most precious possession, but he sent something else with him, and that was the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he changed his most precious possession. Let me ask you a question. What would you say your most precious possession is? Some of you say, well, it's Jesus. Some of you say, well, it's my wife. And some of you say, well, be honest with you, it's my truck. <laughs> Amen. And I want to say this. One of them is more important than the other. And his name ought to be Jesus. Jesus first and your mate second. Amen. Children third. And your truck can be fourth. But I want to say this, friend. There's a visible demonstration of our love, Brother Cody. A visible demonstration of our love. I love these verses. In verse 20 it said, let's go back to 1 John and we'll, we'll finish. In 1 John, the Bible says this in, in chapter 4. I've really enjoyed this study as, almost as well as the Mark study on Sunday. But, you know, the Bible says in verse 20, if a man say I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. And I don't think anybody ought to call somebody a liar unless they're a liar. For he, he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen... How can he love God whom he hath not seen? And so, folks, the claim that is denied. In verse 20, it says, a man says, I love God, and then hates everybody else. I love God, but they have a grudge so heavy that it holds them in, in sadness and, and um, depression, turned outward anger. And folks, listen. They claim, the claim is denied. He says, you're a liar. I didn't say it. God said it. And folks, the Bible says, hate it. Look at that. He that hateth his brother. I could ask you a question. How many has ever hated somebody? The Greek word for hate is detest. It means carrying the idea of persecution. Now, I want you to think about this. John's writing to Christians that are giving their lives for Christ, that have to give it their families for Christ, give it their freedom for Christ, go to jail most of their life for Christ, be crucified for Christ, be drugged through the streets of Lystria for Christ, be uh, boiled in oil and, and on and on as, as John's about to be boiled in oil when he writes the Revelation and in prison for Christ. And he says you ought to love one another. He says you shouldn't even hate the person you're persecuted by. Now, that would be hard. It'd be hard. A man was dying at the stake and he cried out, God, forgive me. And they cried out, why, John, are you asking forgiveness? Because he said, I s smelled the singe of my daughter burning at the stake next to me. And she was crying out for mercy. And for a second, just for a second, I ask God, is it worth it? And I just have to scream out, God, forgive me. And then he gave his life. They made him watch his daughter burned at the stake first. Now, folks, that would be a hard day on the back 40. Say amen. But God said, don't hate, love. So verse 20 says, hey, listen, you might be persecuted, and you're going to hate them for it. You might lose your family, and you're going to, your natural reaction is going to hate them for it. But the Bible says we ought to love one another. And folks, the, the, the connotation for love one another is you need to love everybody, everyone. Say amen. Come on, say amen. 
You Tennessee fans, you need to love the Georgia State University. I just want to throw that in there, praise God. You need to love the people that beat you. That you paid $950,000 to come up and beat you. You got to love them. Praise God. You got to love that you're alive anyway, amen. Love that you made it out of, out of town. We Georgia fans, it's easy for us to love them. <laughs> they never lose. I watch them lose this Sunday. I mean this Saturday, amen. Oh, my goodness. We get so upset over the things of this world. Oh, my goodness. We lose sleep over the things of this world. I've been losing sleep the last couple of nights. It's because three of my dear friends are, in the, uh, are battling for their lives in the hospital. And I just sometimes wake up saying, I'm not grateful enough. I got that good report from the doctor and, the, and, the, and my wife was looking at me like, well, there's got to be something wrong with you. I said, do you want me to be sick? I said, honey, I'm old and overweight. That's my problem. I can't breathe. But I'm going to do something about it. I cut down to three meals yesterday. Amen. <laughs> Gave up sweet tea, two of them, amen. But anyway, listen, didn't make it that third meal. Hate comes like a cloud. It silently hovers over our lives. Hate comes in disguise as envy and jealousy and pride. Hate knows no boundaries, no limits, no finish, no ending. You can kill somebody if you hate them enough. Folks, I want you to know that the evidence of our love is that we count people as precious souls. This is a true story. Another woman, a woman from Philadelphia, acquitted in her divorce. Husband, one dollar, and put in the divorce settlement to buy a rope so you can hang yourself. Now that's hate. Gave him a dollar to go out and buy a rope. That was a long time ago, by the way, praise God. Folks, we need to estimate the worth of one's soul. We need to not feud and be so uh, critical and cynical of people that's fallen in sin. We need to love them. And if we don't love them, how are we going to love them back to God? And how are we going to prove that God's different than everybody else? Come on, say amen. A dollar for a rope. He says, you're a liar. Then I see a, con a conduct that discredits. A conduct that discredits. He says in verse 20, it says, he is a liar. For he has loved not his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he hath not seen? I got to close, but I want to tell you something, friend. We ought to realize that John is saying, you can be a visible demonstration of the love of God which is nothing less than a miracle to love people that persecute you. It's easy to love people that love you. It's easy to love people that's always ministering to you. But folks, we need to realize that God wants us to love people that are hard to love. A.J. Gordon said this, I've long since ceased to pray this, Lord Jesus, have compassion on the lost world. He said, I remember the day when the hour when I seemed to hear the Lord rebuke that prayer. and Making such a statement, Lord, have compassion on the lost world. He said, because it seemed, for him, he, it seemed he said to me, I have had compassion upon the lost world. And now it is for you to have compassion on the lost world. So he's trusted us with compassion. He's trusted us with his love. What a sacred trust. God has blessed us as earthen vessels to be filled of His Spirit. And folks, His Spirit is love. And folks, a lot of times we love one another conditionally. And then I want you to see, last but not least, folks, we see a vital expectation of our love. A vital expectation of our love for God. Look at verse 21. And this commandment have we from him, that he that loveth God loveth his brother. Folks, I want to say this. 
The word command means command. God didn't say love people because you feel like it. A lot of times I don't feel like loving. How about you? God didn't say love people that just love you. He said love one another. It's not a choice. It is a command. It's a command. The king has commanded it. And God has equipped us to unconditionally love others. And folks, the Bible says this, that he who loveth God loveth his brother. And that's the condition. If you love God, you will love others. If you don't love others, you don't love God. You say, I resent that. Hey, go ahead and do whatever you want to with it. But if you resemble it, that's what God says. That you're a liar and that you do not love God. If you cannot love those that you see, how can you love someone you've never seen? So what we need to do is be filled with the love of God. And I want to tell you something, there will be a revival in your life. I want you to just close by just reading 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You knew I was going to go there. But it says, charity or love, verse 4, suffereth long. I want to tell you some of the evidence of love. You're patient with people. Isn't that hard? Come on. Some people got a short fuse. Some people got a chip on their shoulder and they just dare you to knock it off. I've knocked off many chips, I'm telling you. Whew, didn't mean to, but it's there. I'll probably knock it off. But look at this. And it's kind. It's kind. I hate to say this, but a lot of people are kind because they want someone to be kind to them. They are manipulative. You know, I'll love you if you'll love me. God said love anyway. Then look at this. Envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. I mean, get puffed up at people. I mean, you, you wish there was a, uh, one of those symbols, what's it called, emoji, I don't know what they call. You wish there was a puffed up face so you could just send it to people. Is there one? I, I'm sure y'all probably make one up and send it to somebody. You know, just a puffed face. Not a smiley face, not a savage, just a puffed face. I don't know how you'd draw that, but I think some of you ought to come up with it. But listen, folks, it's not easily puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Listen to this. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things. Listen now. Hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails. Folks, if you want to have success in life, you need to be full of God's love. Look at verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, love, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. You're never more like the Lord than when you forgive. And you'll never forgive people until you see them through God's eyes and love one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the message. I pray it's been a challenge as it has been to my heart. But sometimes, God, I get self-centered. Sometimes I get easily offended. Sometimes I'm on the verge of maybe even getting bitter because somebody's hurt me, somebody's left me, somebody's disrespected me. Somebody that I love so much seems not to care. And so, Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'd fill us with your love. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God, we pass from death into life because we love the brethren, but there's only one way to love the brethren. That's Christ in us. Christ dwelleth in us. And, God, I pray that we'd yield to your love. When we want to snap back, we want to be unfaithful, we want to be hateful. We want to get hurt, and hold a grudge, and get even. Fill us, please, with your love.